bonito, já hamzo muna bonito e haani, ni finatun mizu. Para te tutu ni programata pago, ta agang e pa tau tau tano, pro na ihe ni bendisyon, zan pro introduce, I mean pro uma po na ini bendisyon zan ini fresi. Senhor? ตาตอตอนที่ตอนนี้มันตอตอตอนมันมัดตัวพอกุตัวดูสิเชมันรู้สิยินดีนี่กี่มาเชียร์นี่มันนี่ประกาศติดติดกันตัวดีกุตุร
massacro di corazón. Zani mas figo na nina senhor. O ofrecer mais sazo para vai protegi, zanco defendi, e rinendi, e cultura, e linguagem, e aire, e rano sanitano samor. Ni iren choco de rezo que ni na sua estata. Este o afirma que hilo e biblia, zani bandeirahu e bandeira no ahar. Ni tena i se dus masi, as ti si ai fa magu onta. Zangin tai gui kurason mo gui ni hulu gui pisu. Pus hagu lau lau ai na buninitu na ceremonias. Gua hu si ho Cristobozo. Zan i gat song ho pago na ogan si Senator Marilyn Manibusan. Malago zo pago na para bekum bida si Honorable i Speaker si Judy T. Wampat. Todam zo magait ni mangai gigini dale za tintingo si Judy ta to sinahanya. Esta papa gua, gaga gaga ikurasonya gui, tau to malolu si Zudi pagu. Educator si Zudi, retired, dan doktora loke, gui ni gui edukasyon na banda. Ni hiza ta abiba si Zudi, ni hiza nye remarks. Pagu na ogan. I'd like to recognize uh, my colleagues. Thank you very much uh, for being here with us. Um, mayors, uh, other former elected officials, distinguished guests, Dr. Corbin and Dr. Underwood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our first of several forums that the legislature will be conducting to bring our knowledge and experiences of decolonization to a heightened level of social consciousness. Throughout this process, we want to be cognizant and appreciative of all the efforts of our past government and community leaders in Guam's continuing struggle and pursuit to our right to self-determination. Before I go further, may I ask you all to join me in a brief moment of silence to remember our deceased leaders who bore the insults and persecution of their belief that Chamorros need to determine their destiny and whose hard work blazed the trails to bring us to another historic moment of discussion. Thank you. As speaker and more importantly, as an educator by profession, it is imperative that the issue of Guam's non-self-governing status is brought to public discussion and debate. I recognize the relationship of the indigenous peoples to this land and their ongoing responsibilities to it under the watch of their ancestors. In other words, I recognize the ongoing dimensions of the sovereignty of Chamorros in Island Guam. We have been fighting for decades to change our colonial political status, and we have taken our request both to Congress of the Administering Authority and before the international arena within the United Nations. As we know, one of the fundamental principles of international law is set out in Article 1 of the two international covenants on civil and political, economic, social, and cultural rights. Article 1 states, and I quote, all peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they may freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development, end of quote. The United States of America, though, has sought to further limit the application 
of self-determination to indigenous peoples to what is termed international dimensions and has ruled every effort of our quest as recent as the Commonwealth status as non-binding. I must say that my attendance at the University of Guam and the Commission of, on Decolonization Sessions allowed me to develop a greater awareness of the struggles and the deficiencies of all other negotiated covenants and or compacts in our region in, a, in addition to the continuing political status frustration among the insular American flag territories, including the native Hawaiians and the native Alaskans. In light of these current challenges, it is our shared responsibility as elected officials to bring forth all available processes and strategies by invigorating Guam's movement towards decolonization to a full and open discussion before our people, most especially the younger generation. I am not subscribing a debate that has no chance of resolution. In fact, as you will see shortly, this particular discussion is currently delicately poised and may even be heading towards consensus on the issue of fully recognizing the right of self-determination for indigenous peoples. We have in our morning session, Dr. Carlisle Corbin, an internationally recognized subject matter expert who will be speaking on the role of the United Nations and Dr. Robert Underwood, former Guam delegate, delegate to Congress and currently the president of the University of Guam, who would speak on Guam's posture with the administering authority of the United States. Our afternoon session is a further discourse on the legal framework and the processes available to Guam, which will be conducted in a roundtable forum by brilliant legal minds from within our community. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm always available to listen to what any one of you have to say and contribute towards our movement in solidarity to achieve a binding process. Dunklu Nasaina Masi. Thank you, Speaker, Speaker Wampat. Um, buenas. Uh, thank you, Senator Hope, for um, having to agree to facilitate such a uh, momentous occasion, bringing bring the issue of self-determination to light again. And I just want to take this opportunity to personally thank you. All, all, all the time um, you've made Guam's presence in, in the United Nations um, alive. And so uh, in, your, in your status of just being a non-government leader, so I just want to personally thank you. And I'm sure the audience and the people of Guam and our leaders are very appreciative of that. Can we give her a big hand, please? Thank you, Speaker Wampat. Um, that was a very challenging call for uh, all of us here who we, who we call ourselves Chamorros and all other citizens of this territory to come together to support um, a right, um, an inalienable right to determine our destiny. And I see a lot of um, people whose efforts have actually contributed to the quest of where we are today. And personally, again, um, without further ado, I want to um, introduce the first guest speaker for this morning session. Um, and that is uh, the Honorable Dr. Carlisle Corbin, or maybe um, Hope. You know Dr. Corbin a lot more. You've dealt with him. So, uh, yes, I'm going to give you that opportunity. All right. So, just Marcy, Marilyn. Um, <clears throat> in the past uh, and recent years, um, there have been varying degrees of interest that have been expressed uh, regarding uh, our dependency status, or rather, the dependency statuses of all five territories under the United States. So Guam is not the only one who has been looking at this relationship very seriously 
all five territories, including, for example, American Samoa has conducted an extensive review of political status options through their what they call Future Political Status Study Commission study. Um, this study was published in 2007, and it was the third and most comprehensive analysis on political status-related issues. So American Samoa had convened a constitutional convention that had uh, proposed more authority uh, for their elected government. Then you have the territory of Puerto Rico. The three main political parties there, uh, which favor political, different political alternatives, have continued efforts at br bringing closure to the Commonwealth's long-standing political status dilemma referenced in the 2011 Obama administration White House report on Puerto Rico. Um, there's been much needed clarity on the primacy of the territorial clause of the U.S. Constitution under Commonwealth status with implications on the future, political future of other U.S. territories as well. And then we have the U.S. Virgin Islands of which Dr. Corbin is from. Uh, they've proposed significant revisions in their present political arrangement with the drafting of a constitution adopted by its fifth constitutional convention just in 2010. And of course, we have the Northern Mariana Islands. The Northern Mariana Islands, and Dr. Corbin just came back uh, from there uh, the a couple days ago. They are also reassessing and re-looking at their, uh, the legislation that has created, or rather the covenant that has created their relationship between the US and the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, the application of U.S. labor and immigration laws not specifically included in the original covenant that was agreed between the territory and the U.S. has created this challenge for them. Um, legislation to review their present status and to examine other political alternatives is currently under consideration. This mood of reassessment doesn't stop there. Territories have continually been reassessing their relationships with the, the mother country, the United States. So here we are in Guam. We are now restarting a self-determination process that is long overdue. Uh, and hard as it is, we really have come a long way. And um, today's uh, forum is another one of those forums uh, that we see now going around basically uh, and originally generated by a lot of non-governmental organizations. Thanks to those organizations, the discourse and the discussions continue. And so I'm very proud to um, introduce to you Dr. Corbin, who is the Executive Secretary of the Council of Presidents of the United Nations General Assembly and an international advisor on governance, self-determination, and multilateral diplomacy. He presently serves as advisor to the U.S. Virgin Islands Fifth Constitutional Convention and is on the faculty of the uh, Institute for Future Global Leaders of the University of the Virgin Islands. He has had a distinguished career in territorial political development, serving as Minister of State for External Affairs of the U.S. Virgin Islands government, former Washington representative to the governor and the territory's representative to various United Nations multilateral bodies, including the Alliance of Small Island States. He lectures widely on governance, political development, and multilateral diplomacy, and is the founder and senior editor of the online Overseas Territories Review and its printed publication, The Overseas Territories Report providing information and critical analysis on development issues affecting Pacific, Caribbean, and other non-independent countries. Please, let's welcome Dr. Carlisle Corbin. Again, half a day, buenas, and good morning. 
I am very humbled by what has occurred before I took this podium this morning. I, I think I have a period of 45 minutes, which I will not take in the interest of the dialogue that we, we should have. But I think that it's important for me, first of all, to recognize Madam Speaker, the Honorable Judith Juan Pat, distinguished members of the 31st legislature, Honorable Mayors, Dr. Robert Underwood, President of the University of Guam, members of the Guam Commission on Decolonization who are present, Mr. Ed Alvarez, ex Executive Director of the Commission, and fellow presenters, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor to participate in this most important forum on Guam's quest for self-determination and decolonization. I wish to express my appreciation to the government of the University of Guam, in particular, the School of Social Work, Dr. Lisa Natividad, for facilitating my visit to the office, uh, to, this, uh, to Guam this time, and also to the Office of the Governor for facilitating arrangements. I wish to congratulate Speaker Juan Pat in conjunction with President Underwood for their efforts in coordinating this timely discussion on the decolonization of Guam, which is very much the unfinished business of the United States and the unfinished business of the United Nations. I will focus on this a bit later. I refer to the, this process as the unfinished business of the national and international levels, even if there is a tendency for some to dismiss the international dimension of the process in favor of a purely domestic one and a purely domestic interpretation. It is a posture all too often taken by some of our friends in Washington and beyond. As a former Washington representative of several governors of the U.S. Virgin Islands, I'm quite familiar with these arguments, which sometimes take on a less than positive tone, especially as it relates to the applicability of international law to the process. As a member of the Virgin Islands Political Status Commission in the 1990s, which conducted the only referendum in our history on political status options, I remember well the challenges which we faced then in convincing some in the federal bureaucracy of the legitimacy of our quest for self-determination, and those concerns still remain today. The objective reality is, is, however, quite clear. When the United States Senate ratified the United Nations Charter on July 29, 1945, it took on certain responsibilities as an administering power. That is, as a country which administers a territory, or more than one territory. Indeed, the establishment of the United Nations that same year, following the end of the Cold War, marked the beginning of the emergence of the internationally recognized right to self-determination, which is intended to, to lead to complete decolonization. The principle of self-determination for peoples is longstanding and was recognized by the international community as early as 1919. This evolved into the recognition of the self-determination as a basic right reflected in the United Nations Charter. In 1919, of course, was the League of Nations, which was the forerunner of the United Nations. So the issue of self-determination and the principle of self-determination was very clear in that early stage. It was later recognized by the United Nations as a fundamental human right, which takes it into a different dimension. The evolving United Nations process on the rights of indigenous peoples with the adoption in 2007 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples indicates that the scope of this internationally recognized right has significantly evolved. In this connection, the power of a dual rights legal strategy developed by attorney Julian Uggen in his 2008 University of Hawaii Law Review article and his subsequent work on this issue serve as building blocks toward the construction of a firm and sustainable traditional house of a decolonized Guam capable of withstanding credible challenge. 
the earlier work of former judge and present Senator B.J. Cruz on the history of United States law as it pertains to voter eligibility in special elections is crucial to clarifying much of the current discussion on this matter. I am anxious to hear the presentations of these two tomorrow legal scholars later in these proceedings. In fact, my presentation today should be considered introductory to their analysis. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the framework of the self-determination process and the responsibilities of administering powers are spelled out in several places in the United Nations Charter, beginning with the first chapter, as Speaker Wanpat had made reference to in her remarks. This reference refers to the respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples. The United Nations' role in this, in this process was delineated in the provision of the United Nations Charter containing the Declaration regarding non-self-governing territories. This provision commits the individual United Nations member states which administer territories whose people have not yet attained a full measure of self-government to develop self-government in those territories. It also requires that due account be taken of the political aspirations of the peoples and to assist them in the, the progressive development of their free political institutions according to the, the particular circumstances of each territory and its peoples and their varying stages of advancement. The concept of self-government at the formation of the United Nations was not well defined and sub subsequent resolutions of the General Assembly, as well as international conventions, several of which were made reference to by the speaker, were needed to give substance and refinement to the principle of self-determination. Accordingly, as far back as 1952, a resolution was adopted on future procedures for determining whether a territory has achieved a full measure of self-government. The same year, a resolution was adopted on the rights of peoples and nations to self-determination. Both of these re early resolutions initiated a process of identifying a full measure of self-government through the political options of independence, internal self-government, and integration, while emphasizing that for the standard of self-government to be met, freedom from control or interference by the government of another state in respect of the internal government of the territory was required, along with complete autonomy in respect of economic and social affairs. In 1953, the General Assembly adopted a resolution which defined self-government as independence or the attainment of other separate systems of government and recommended that these concepts be used as a guide in determining whether any territory, due to changes in its constitutional status, might not lo may no longer be considered as non-self-governing. This resolution also emphasized the requirement that there be freedom from control or interference in respect of the internal government, legislative, executive, judiciary, and administration of the territory. This resolution marked the beginning of the articulation of certain minimum standards required in the process of attaining self-government, noting that the manner in which territories can become fully self-governing is primarily through the attainment of these three. As long, and I emphasize that the option that is chosen is done and based free on, upon freely the basis of absolute equality. The issue of absolute equality became a very important determination at that time. As we see the options that are available to us today, we find that the, the minimum standards make reference to the question of absolute political equality. This is a important uh, principle that continues to be applied. Now, with respect to the decolonization declaration, we are familiar with what we know as the landmark resolution 1514 
which is known as the Magna Carta of decolonization. This condition of absolute equality and a clear definition of legitimate options of self-government were further refined in that declaration. This was 1960. Was this contained a set of principles on the attainment of full self-government. And a companion resolution was also adopted, which I will refer to a bit later, Resolution 1541, which refers to uh, refine, further refining the basis for what is, constitutes full self-government. And as my good friend and colleague, uh, Hope Cristobal, mentioned, I just returned uh, several days ago from Saipan uh, with a, and I had an honor of a joint uh, meeting with the joint session of the House and Senate uh, who are looking at the question of uh, reassessment of their arrangement, the Commonwealth arrangement. And in fact, the uh, reference to 1541 and the minimum standards in 1541 is contained in a bill uh, submitted uh, once again uh, by Representative Torres. And as you, I'm sure meant, most of you have been following the developments there. And Representative Torres' bill is in fact uh, now has passed the House and it is before the, uh, the Senate in the bicameral legislature of the Northern Mariana Islands. It's very important that the, the, com the conversations that we had was, were very rich, a very interesting interactive dialogue, and they're in fact in, in the mode of reassessment given the issues that uh, uh, Dr. Cristobal made reference to in terms of the uh, concerns over labor, immigration, but also submerged lands, which is an issue that affects all uh, territories, the idea of the control ownership of submerged lands. If we look at the matter of resolutions of the United Nations, you will find that many of the resolutions make specific reference to ownership, control, and disposal of, of natural resources, including marine resources, lies with the people of the territories. Now, there is a clear disconnect between the international declarations on these matters and how federal policy sometimes is put in place. And there needs to be a coming together of those as we move forward. Now, in reference to the decolonization declaration, it states, as the speaker has mentioned, that all peoples have the right to self-determination, and by virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. This set the stage for the inclusion of provisions in the, on the inalienable right to self-determination in subsequent human rights conventions and more recent reiterations in United Nations resolutions to self-determination as a fundamental human right. Now this declaration the, the decolonization declaration, pointed to the inconsistency of dependency arrangements with the principles of the United Nations Charter and identified political dependency as an impediment to the promotion of world peace and cooperation. It emphasized that immediate steps should be taken in the territories to transfer all powers to the people of these territories without any conditions or reservations in accordance with the freely expressed wish of the people. The applicability to the small island territories as our own of these principles has been continually reaffirmed by the United Nations. In fact, all countries of the world have joined in the consensus on the resolutions on these issues. I, I would now move to what we refer to as the options of political equality. And given the United Nations framework and how the United Nations is structured, one has to pull from the debates and the resolutions and the charter and the other instruments to identify the options of political equality. These have been, have been very clearly set, uh, set forth. As I mentioned, the resolution 1541, which re makes reference to the three options of uh, political equality, which is in fact, uh, if you look at the, re the references in the Puerto Rico legislation, which is presently before the Puerto Rico legislature, introduced by Governor Fortunio, 
there are the three options uh, that will be available. In fact, I'm not suggesting this, but this I'm giving you the indication of how they are addressing it. Uh, they are in Puerto Rico providing for a measure of a two-stage referendum, the first being wishing to remain the same or wishing to change. If the choice is to remain the same, then nothing happens for a period of time, and then the issue is revisited once again. On the other hand, if people choose to change, then the options of the three options contained in 1541 would be the three options that would be addressed. But the important thing to note, among other things, is that the, if the decision is to remain the same, it does mean that it is a very narrow interpretation as we are now experiencing, as since Puerto Rico is a commonwealth. It was the first commonwealth, in fact, and it had a very basic relationship with the, the context of being an, uh, having an autonomous arrangement with the United States. However, over time, court decisions have uh, whittled away at their autonomy, and now uh, many of the people who pr promote commonwealth in Puerto Rico, which includes the members of the, uh, one of the main political parties, is, uh, many of them are deciding to pr support a free association arrangement because the autonomy that they require and that they seek to have, they have determined cannot be achieved under the present territorial commonwealth. Uh, this is an evolution of thinking during, in the context there. I know there are those who, who promote the idea and the concept that free association, for example, is a form of independence. In reality, and in, in alternatively, uh, free association actually in Puerto Rico's case and in other cases, and probably in the case of the Northern Mariana Islands, that option is emerging from Commonwealth and the restrictions that are becoming apparent under the Commonwealth arrangement. So it's a, it's, it is a natural flow from the middle. And the middle uh, uh, options between the three are the ones that are effectively uh, the one where, ones that can be very, very uh, creative. Uh, there are many models of, of, of those kinds of autonomous arrangements in the world. Uh, coming from the Virgin Islands, our historical colonial background is that of Denmark, uh, of all places. Uh, and Denmark has uh, uh, Greenland and the Faroe Islands presently, which is a very interesting uh, example of uh, one of the studies that I've, I've been working on uh, with the Danish, with the Danish uh, Institute is looking at all of the places where Denmark has been in the world. Denmark was, Denmark was where the Vikings, the, the guys with the hats and the horns sticking out of the hats. Uh, they, had, they were also very seafaring uh, peoples. And so they went all the way to the Caribbean and, uh, and beyond. Uh, they went to Iceland, they went to Greenland, the Faroe Islands, they went to the west coast of Africa. And all of these places have Danish uh, connections and, and there's also Danish influence. And the surnames, I, I note clearly surnames in, in Micronesia are often uh, influenced tremendously by, by the Spanish uh, colonialism. Surnames in the Virgin Islands are influenced by Danish colonialism. Uh, so in addition to the fact that these are issues where Greenland and Faroe Islands have emerged as very autonomous arrangements, but one of the interesting things that they have done is to retain the Danish citizenship. So this is a very critical and very a novel and very flexible arrangement, uh, which is also the case here in the, in the Pacific with respect to the Cook Islands and Niue in their relationship to New Zealand. It is the case, uh, it is not the case with respect to the Federated States of Micronesia, Marshall Islands, or Palau, which have a separate citizenship, but which have entry into uh, the United States and its territories, and that has obviously been an issue here in Guam as well as in Hawaii. Uh, the question then becomes whether or not such autonomous flexibility can be achieved under the United States uh, uh, Constitution or under an arrangement with the United States that circumvents the, uh, the unilateral applicability of the United States Constitution to 
the territories. And this is a question that is, has been asked and continues to be debated uh, in all of the territories. I, I do some work with the government of Maui Nui, uh, otherwise known as uh, French Polynesia. And they also are having some, and a very interesting kind of an arrangement because their arrangement is non-autonomous, uh, although the title is autonomy. Uh, yet they also have the uh, unfortunate uh, uh, occurrence of having the unilateral applicability of the French law. And so the French can effectively change their laws similar to, there's probably, there's, there is a uh, provision in the French Constitution that uh, is, a, is a synonymous to the territorial clause. Uh, they, I guess all of these arrangements, one can identify where the power lies. And that, this is really where, where, the, where we can examine where we are so that we can know, in fact, where we are going. Now, in, in regards to the options of free association and integration, as alternatives to independence, the, the, the Resolution 1541 provides a minimum set of standards for the attainment of political equality by the people of the territories. Regarding free association, uh, this arrangement must be on the basis of a free and voluntary choice by the people concerned expressed through informed and democratic processes. This option should respect the individuality and cultural characteristics of the territory and its peoples and retains for the peoples of the territory, which is associated with another country, the freedom to modify the status of that territory through the expression of their will and by democratic means and through constitutional processes. The right to determine the internal constitution without external interference is also a very important element in that document. Regarding the option of political integration, which is another of the, th which is the third option that uh, is, is, on, is uh, available under the context of absolute political equality, it is important to note that integration is, must be full and complete. There is no, partial integration is not, uh, is not considered legitimate. Uh, I, I do some work with the, uh, one of the Dutch territories in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, there are five, there used to be five islands together. They had up to, uh, as, of, well, as of 2010, they fragmented. They called it the dismantlement. I call it the fragmentation uh, because now they all have five different governments and they're very small and, and very uh, uh, vulnerable. But what occurred was that three of them sought and voted in a referendum for direct ties with the, with the motherland. And in fact, uh, the direct ties were interpreted as being annexed. And uh, that is what has occurred with them. And that annexation did not provide them with full political rights as required under international law. As a result, this is where the questions become to determine the deficiencies in the arrangement of, of integration. Uh, the people do not have full political rights, full voting rights. The people do not, in the Dutch system, the people do not have access to certain programs that would come to them if, in fact, they were fully integrated. So that is an issue that is underway today uh, in those places. In addition to that, two of those territories are now autonomous countries in the kingdom, but in the wash, as a result, they have a reduced level of autonomy. The question is whether that autonomy meets the level of full uh, autonomy and, and full um, absolute political rights. Now, under integration, it's important to note, therefore, that the people of both territories should have equal status and rights of citizenship and equal guarantees of fundamental rights and freedoms without any distinction or discrimination. Uh, political integration also requires that the people of the former territory that integrates with another country should have equal rights and opportunities for representation and effective participation at all levels of the government. So there are those, the reference to the U.S. territories being a part of the United States is a general term, 
but the rights of the people with respect to the United States does not, is not consistent with that, given that our representation is uh, very vibrant and, and forceful, certainly uh, uh, the, the present delegates in, in, the, in the United States House from the five U.S. territories and commonwealths, our, our earlier delegates, and particularly uh, former delegate uh, Underwood, were all very, they, as there's a phrase in, in, in boxing, they call punching above your weight. Uh, they, they really did represent well and continue to represent. Uh, without the vote, it's, it's difficult, and only one is difficult. Puerto Rico has four million people, but only has one non-voting representative. Uh, it doesn't, it's not consistent with their, their numbers, it's not consistent with their political power. So that is one of the reasons why there's a big statehood movement in Puerto Rico, uh, as well as other movements that are more autonomous. This um, question then is, is important because, in fact, the issue of integration becomes clear as in, in 1970, 10 years after the decolonization declaration when there was further discussion on what constitutes full self-government, further refinement, and, and you see as a continuum, historically, you have a continuum of self-government proceeding. In, 1970, in 1970, um, there was an attempt to utilize one resolution uh, to legitimize the dependency status or by consent, even if the internal governance arrangements would fall short of the achievement of full, a full measure of self-government and political equality. In fact, the, the intent at that time was to recognize that these models could be very flexible, but yet uh, there was attempts to use that to legitimize the arrangements. Now, these resolutions are but a part of the lengthy authority for the self-determination process and the subsequent de decolonization of a territory such as Guam which is one of the 16 remaining dependencies on the United Nations list. There are probably just as many that are not listed. And in fact, part of the work that I am engaged in with the government of Maui Nui is the question of reinscription. Uh, there were territories that were removed from the United Nations list, uh, either by resolution during the time when only the larger countries had a vote, or whether, or in some cases, they were simply omitted from the new list, which came years after. Uh, this is now, uh, there is, are attempts now to correct this, the, these omissions, uh, even as the United Nations itself is suffering from a bit of decolonization fatigue, given that since 1990, uh, the, the territories, uh, there have been only two territories that have come off the list. One is Namibia in, in Southwest Africa, and the other is Timor-Leste, East Timor, in this region, Asia-Pacific region. Since that time, the United Nations has struggled to bring self-determination and ultimate decolonization to the remaining territories. And as a result, even as we speak today, uh, time considerations of uh, time differences on Friday, New York time, the United Nations Fifth Committee will examine a proposal to reduce the budget of the United Nations in the decolonization area by something, some 40%. Uh, so as I've been here, I, I've been working on some text uh, for, uh, to present in the Fifth Committee from some members in order to justify the retention of at least the current level. But the difficulty is not so much on the current level as it is on the implementation of what is, what is adopted. And we have, if you look through the resolutions of the United Nations, uh, as I'm speaking here, as well as those that come later, you'll find that the resolutions are very specific, calling for specific actions, not only on the part of the United Nations system, but also on the part of the uh, federal government. And in fact, uh, some, in some cases, uh, uh, these initiatives have not been undertaken. Uh, I use one example as a very key, and that is the question of public education and political education. And I think one of the biggest constraints to, to our moving forward is the question of having the substantial enough resources to 
have a sustained initiative on public education on where we are presently and also on what our options are. And, and in some cases, uh, the deficiencies in particular, the deficiencies that exist presently. Because many of those deficiencies that exist have a great correlation to the, the, some of the social and economic development issues that we experience in our territories. An upgrading of our, of our relationship, I use the word modernization. And I use that word because I don't seek to inflame uh, there are words that I use. This, I don't use the C word. Very rarely you hear me use the C word, and you know what that word is. It's not Corbin. It's it's oh. not your world. I use the C, I use that C word. That's a C H word. <laughs> the C word of colonialism. I don't use that word because that word is in fact inflammatory. Now I think for me I wouldn't use the word because you can accomplish the same thing by discussing it in a different way, and in many respects the issue of looking at the deficiencies of our, our arrangement is where we need to begin. Um, I'll speak a bit now in the interest of time. I think I have about five minutes. Okay. The speaker gives me five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the issue of the United Nations review process, I think, was one of the issues I was asked to address. I think the political dependency arrangements of the territories listed by the United Nations at the present 16, go through the annual uh, review by the United Nations through various committees. At the beginning of each year, the Special Committee on Decolonization convenes, elects its bureau, chair, vice chair, rapporteur, and it also adopts its agenda um, and selects um, the venue for its regional seminars, which alternate between the Caribbean and Pacific uh, these seminars are held each spring, uh, and they are pursuant to the, this is now the third international decade for the eradication of the C word. Um, now, in this case, th this, uh, this is the third international decade, uh, the first being beginning in 1990, uh, adopted in 1990, and through the 90s, the first decade of the, of the new century, and now we're in the second decade of the new century. Now, I have uh, had the honor of being selected to participate in these seminars in a dual capacity during the time that I was in government uh, as the Virgin Islands government representative and also uh, have been selected as an independent expert uh, during, during that time uh, up until around 2006 when I, I, I left the government, government service and then I was serving as a, in a singular capacity as an independent expert most recently in New Caledonia uh, in 2010 uh, where I worked with uh, with, once again, had the great uh, honor to work with my good friend and colleague, uh, Hope Cristobal. Um, in earlier years, I had the, the great pleasure of, of working with my close friend, the late Ron Rivera, and the former vice chair of the Guam Commission on self determination and longtime activist. Now, Ed Alvarez, present commission on the colonization director, presented the position of the Guam government at the 2011 seminar, which was held in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Now these are consistent approaches to the international system that are very critical. It's very also important to note that in the absence of government, uh, there is also very strong support has always been presented by the non-governmental organizations of Guam. Uh, the We Are Guahan, uh, the predecessor, one of the predecessor organizations, the Organization of People for Indigenous Rights. Uh, there are several others uh, that have been involved with uh, this issue for a long time, and it is so encouraging for me that when I am at the University of Guam, I have occasion to see the younger generation involved as well, and that is very, very because this is a long, this is the long haul. This is something that will always be uh, a part of the development of all of our territories. Now, the report of the seminar that takes place in each, each territory, uh, rather in uh, alternating between the Pacific and the Caribbean, uh, is, is then sent to the, uh, to the United Nations. Now, this seminar is comp uh, takes place where over a three-day period, governments of the, of the committee, of the UN committee, have an opportunity to listen to the governments of the territories at length 
as well as to listen to non-governmental organizations and perspectives of, of individual experts. Uh, some from the territory, some not from the territory, is a determination made by the United Nations. Now, the idea that uh, statements are also made, therefore, uh, by the chair of the committee, and ultimately the report goes to the United Nations Special Committee on Decolonization, which convenes every June. And during that time, the report is one of the seminars, one of the elements that they address uh, and also debate, along with other items, including the implementation of the decolonization declaration, as well as the, implement, the assistance to the territories from the United Nations system. And this is where a lot of the involvement uh, uh, is available, but unfortunately, for some case, in many cases, territories are not aware of the fact that such assistance is available to them. So part of my uh, role I have taken on is to try to advise territories of what is available uh, for them in, in their development, not only in their, in their political development, but also in their social and economic development. Guam, for example, is an associate member of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, which has been the case for several decades. Uh, this is a very important and useful uh, uh, tool to uh, access uh, technical assistance and information and advice of the United Nations system in a, in a range of areas. We spoke about this a bit in, uh, in Saipan also uh, over the, in the last several days. The other uh, organizations that are available, in fact, very recently uh, through the work of Governor Togiola of American Samoa, uh, there is now uh, an observer status for Guam, American Samoa, and the Northern Mariana Islands in the Pacific Islands Forum, which is a very important, uh, uh, useful tool, uh, not only in terms of, of breaking the, 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 the uh, cycle of isolation, which often takes place in territories vis-a-vis -vis the region, but it also it allows for issues to be brought to that table that you want the, the international support for. And that international support within the United Nations system begins with the region that you are in. So in a context, this is how the United Nations functions as a regional bloc. Uh, and this is very, so as in looking at the self-determination and, and decolonization initiatives, support from the region is really first and foremost and primary before moving it forward to the, the wider international community. Now, this, the resolutions of the United Nations are then adopted um, in the Special Committee on Decolonization. Most are adopted by consensus, meaning there is no vote. Uh, there's not even a roll call vote, which is uh, just simply adopted by consensus. On the other hand, there are a few that are voted upon, and then there, there are several resolutions that are, that are voted all the way through. Now, the resolutions go to the fourth committee, which is the Committee of the Whole, and that committee convenes in, in uh, October, first week of October every year. It takes the resolutions of the special committee and debates them. There's a similar uh, process. In fact, I, I may mention that governments of the territories and non-governmental organizations and experts can address both the special committee in June and also the fourth committee in, in October in order to present the views. Um, I think this year, of course, I had the honor of, of, of seeing the speaker present a very dynamic presentation to the fourth committee. Uh, and it was uh, very well received. As, as she was reading, I was looking up to see how, what, the, what the, the interest was. And everyone was, was turning around to see who was this person that was presenting so strongly. And I think that's very, very important that they consistently hear your message because there's a tendency to, if they don't hear you, they forget about you. So it's important to keep that, that alive. Um, now, when it gets to the fourth committee, ultimately the, the, the similar process happens where there's a uh, vote or consensus. And then at the stage we are in presently, uh, the, the, the General Assembly as a whole will take up the issue in about another three weeks or so, maybe four weeks or so, of the resolutions of that committee. Now, in the interest of time, yeah. one minute. One minute. Uh, one minute. 
I didn't want to take all the time I was given, but anyway. I think that I've given you some indication of how the United Nations system works, the resolutions, the mandate, essentially the mandate which is comprised of all of those things, including the charter and the various international conventions. There is an international mandate. And this mandate is, is very important, but it has to be implemented. But for it to be implemented, we need to be aware of what the mandate actually is. And we need to also un be aware of what it is that we want before we move forward. And in that context, the idea of assessing the present status for any deficiencies that exist is a good starting point. Uh, because you, in order to know where to go, it's, it's good to know where you are. And, and I think sometimes um, we need to spend a little time on that. We certainly are trying to advise uh, a number of the governments in that regard in order that the governments will be aware of the deficiencies as it relates to the international law and what their relationship should be. I think this is the next logical step in the self-determination process for the territories. And it is a component of the legislation, as I mentioned, recently adopted in, in the Northern Mariana Islands. It is therefore useful that an in-depth, detail examination of the present relationship is, 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 could be a useful tool for you uh, in terms of identifying once and for all where democratic deficiencies exist. With the veil of illusion of full self-government removed, then a self-determination process can be accelerated and a political st status to meet the needs of the 21st century can be, be achieved in earnest. And with that, I thank you and apologize for the length of my presentation. Thank you. Si Zeus Masi, Dr. Corbin, I idiretsu ni tauto paguta discukuti na ogaan. Si Dr. Corbin just enlightened us a little bit about our, well, a lot about our international personality as a non self-governing territory, and um, also highlighted some issues about our domestic personality as the unincorporated territory of the United States. Um, just some basic uh, information here about the UN, Dr. Corbin, in 1945, it was established by 51 sovereign states, the United Nations, by the US, the UK, China, and Russia, and they decided on the structure and the function of this organization. Then we have the UN Charter, which today is a treaty of nations that is considered law by the US. In Article 73, we see that member states with territories whose peoples have not yet attained a full measure of self-government recognize the principle that the interest the interest of the inhabitants of these territories are paramount and accept as a sacred trust the obligation to promote to the utmost the well-being of the inhabitants of these territories, to ensure the due respect for the culture of the peoples concerned, their political, economic, social, and educational advancement, their just treatment, to develop self-government, to take due account of the political aspirations of the peoples and to assist them in the progressive development of their free political institutions. Sidzus um, Maasi, Dr. Corbin, for that presentation. Thank you, Dr. Corbin. We're going to have a little change in our program, Hope. Um, speaker gave me a little note in saying uh, we would like to really feed all our, our members here that are here. I thank all of you. I would be remiss if I really didn't recognize the efforts of the past members of the Commission on Self-Determination, whose um, chairman was uh, Dr. Joe, I mean, Governor Joe Ada, and um, how uh, Senator Pilar Lujan, um, whose um, testimonies before the United Nations were very provocative also, and it got that attention. So Senator Lohan, thank you so much for all your past efforts. Thank you, my colleague. I also like to recognize the efforts of um, the self, oh, Congressman, um, Congresswoman 
delegate, Madeline Bordalio, also was a member of that commission, and, and she's not here, but I see Ken Paris. Um, but you know, those efforts of past leaders uh, have um, made their mark and their imprints. Um, I would also be remiss if I did not recognize the members of the Commission on Decolonization, who has, who has been tasked to continue this form, to continue raising awareness, and uh, so we could have the Chamorros uh, determine their destiny. I would like to recognize the presence, of course, of Speaker Wampat and uh, this form today, Senator uh, Rory Rispishu and Senator Frank Bloss, who are members of the commission. Thank you um, for being there. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Joe Garrido, uh, represents Free Association, Trini Torres, uh, Independence, and Eddie, Senator Eddie Duenas on statehood. Thank you. Uh, we have Mayor Ben Gomatalto. Thank you for being here, uh, Mayor. I, I saw you earlier. Um, absent, of course, is um, um, the governor. Um, he's, he's just got back, at, uh, being the ambassador for Guam and other areas, so we thank him for his leadership. We have the Speaker of the Youth Congress, Andrew Orsini, Dr. Lisa Natividad, who is an at-large member, and Joseph Cruz is also an at-large member. We ask um, your prayers and support to um, have you continue this dialogue. And, um, you know, we, won't, we want to thank the University of Guam, again, for the prior forum, for the refreshments this morning. So can we give them a big hand? And, of course, the Bank of Guam for their lunch. And I would be so, so bad if I did not recognize the ongoing effort of the Chamorro Registry, whose leadership is under Senator Ben Pangalinen. Um, the registry is right outside Senator Ben Pangalinen, Donklu Nesidus Maasi. Um, the registry is outside for those of you who would like to um, register. Uh, the change of the program will lead us now. We're going to refrain from any questions and answers, and I would like to call on um, Dr. Robert Underwood. You know, uh, May I call you Robert? I rem you know, some people um, say that the issue of political status uh, would not have been a very um, vigorous subject now, that we won't be talking about it if it wasn't really for the efforts of a grassroots movement and the parapeta with Dr. Underwood. And so I like to um, thank him that, um, you know, we bring awareness that if Wetsa, the power lies, still lies with the people, okay? Na hamzu gaigi if Wetsa. Hamzu ki kanan mizu gaigi if Wetsa. And the Honorable Robert Underwood is a former member of the United States Congress and is currently the president of the University of Guam. And I'm very um, proud and honored to be the one to introduce him. As an educator, he has served as academic vice president at the University of Guam, and he is a distinguished scholar with many publications to his credit. He served as the congressional delegate from Guam in the 103 to 107th Congresses from 1993 to 2003, during which he sponsored major legislation for Guam. And he played an active role in the Department of Defense authorization bills and was a forceful advocate, continued to be a forceful advocate, if I may say so, for political development for insular areas and the extension of educational and social opportunities for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. During his tenure in Congress, he became a senior member of both the House Armed Services and Resources Committees. He was a ranking member for several subcommittees. He emphasized the importance of Guam and the Asian Pacific region in national st strategic policy and worked to enhance the benefits of military personnel, especially those in the Guard and Reserve units. He also worked to protect the nation's environmental assets, particularly the oceans and coral reefs. I ask you to join me in giving him a round of applause and to welcome him. Sidus Masi, Marilyn, buenos dias todos hamzo, colonia hamzo ni manauto e legislatura, en agradeciste na dinania para tafanguentos diridi por estado politicar. Zawa na be menciona na si Speaker Wampat, si Hope, dan si Marilyn, dan bo mismo no todos hamzo manauto sinania antes dan. Sinania rules. 
Just thought I'd tell that out. I know there are other Sinanya people out there. <laughs> hey, let's go, Sinanya. <laughs> All right. Now that I've ruined uh, my whole presentation because there are others from other places, but uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, normally I, I, I don't do PowerPoints, I just try to make powerful points. That's, uh, that's what I normally do. But, uh, you know, there's a very, uh, uh, and, and I appreciate the work of, uh, of uh, Carlisle on this and uh, his generosity in terms of his efforts and trying to bring us to understanding this. But uh, th there's a whole bunch of things out there that are very difficult to uh, kind of internalize because they really are a lot of conflicting trends, and sometimes we don't really uh, uh, bring a level of, um, I don't know, maybe a kind of a comprehensive overview. So I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to provide this. Uh, the desire to make uh, progress and develop politically and the impetus to engage in an act of self-determination are the twin motivations for our island's social progress. They speak to the essence of any society and they can be charted in the context of very unique histories. And one of the things that we have to focus in is our particular unique history. And in the case of Guam, the compendium of historical circumstances have really led us to where we're at here in the year uh, 2011. The compendium kind of winds its way back through our own history that includes settlement by the original inhabitants uh, probably uh, 4,000 years ago. Between that time frame 4,000 years ago and the appearance of the West in 1521 and the invasion in 1668, we are really unsure about all the dynamics of social change that occurred before the arrival of the West and all the multiple possible waves of migration that may have occurred uh, from multiple sources. But we usually fix our ancient uh, Chamorro past at the time of Western intrusion uh, during the lifetimes of uh, Diego Sambatores and Kepuha, uh, Hurao, and Matapan. And that's the kind of uh, first lodestar, if you will, where we kind of fix this. Uh, it, does, it may not be the only lodestar, but it is uh, a primary lodestar, and that's the, the lodestar that the Tauto Tano uh, brings to uh, the, 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 this celebration. Um, but we are the inhabitants of that very first island, Pacific Island, to be colonized uh, by the West. In the words of the great uh, Pacific anthropologist Douglas Oliver, the rape of Oceania began with Guam. From that point on, uh, to being part of the Spanish Empire, to being governed from Mexico, to being a subunit of the Philippines, to the arrival of the U.S. in 1898, World War II, the international recognition of non-self-governing areas in the post-World War II era, to our own internal political foment, and very distinct uh, measures of incremental progress, we are at a point here in uh, 2011 where this generation, your generation, our generation, no matter how you look at it, is commanded to do our part in ensuring that not that we have a cataclysmic event of sorts, but that we continue the desire for political change and political self-fulfillment in a way that brings honor to those who came before us and all of us and which will inspire those who become afterwards. So I start this by saying that we ought to take a look at our historical experience, that we have to review uh, are those experiences critically. We have to know what they are. We can't just kind of bluff our way through it. And I hear so many people kind of just bluff their way through it. They don't really understand a lot of the things that they're talking about. They just use them because they sound very convenient. So I would say, you know, you have to go retro. You have to be retrospective before you're introspective. So go retro before you be intro. And so that's the uh, way, you know, and I take this opportunity because that's what I am, basically, an historian, okay? And then inspiration to aspiration. Historical inspiration always leads us to future aspirations. We like to say that the political destiny is in our hands. That's a rhetorical flourish that we like to say, but in reality, it's not, not entirely, could be, 
Depends on what we do. Depends on how we triangulate this process. Someone came to me and said, can we take, can we take advantage of the Arab Spring because the Obama administration is paying homage to what's going on in Tunisia and then what happened in Egypt? I said, yes, we can. If you can get 10,000 people in the street, then you can be the tomorrow spring. Yeah. But if all you're going to get is 10 people, don't bother. Don't waste our time. So political, it is in your hands if you really take it into your hands. But the reality is, is that political control is in the hands of Washington. They control the instruments of everything that we do politically. Uh, there's, uh, some people lament that, some people are depressed by that, other people are comforted by that, but the reality that we have is that we are, uh, in fact, the political structure we have, the legal structure, the framework that we have, are things that are governed out of the, out of the uh, processes that exist in Washington, D.C. And we can be inspired by our heroes or depressed uh, by our colonial past and present. And I'm always fond of saying that you can be inspired and you can aspire, but in order to get where you want to get, you have to perspire. <laughs> and if you're not going to perspire, you're not willing to perspire, then forget all the inspirational talk and all the aspirations in the world. Don't amount to a hill of beans unless you're willing to put in uh, the work that it takes. And, and, and that takes a lot of uh, collaboration and coordination with others. All right. We begin with a discussion of the uh, Tautotano. And the Tautotano is what we uh, normally refer to, you know, there's a lot of uh, 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 indigenous dance groups, and uh, we refer to these people as the Tautotano, as the people who were here originally. And we are the spiritual and physical and cultural inheritors of that legacy who were conquered. Uh, for those of us today, we uh, say that we reject the conquest, but at the same time that we say that we reject the conquest, we have to really understand we were really conquered. <laughs> we were really conquered. That's an important thing to remember. You don't have elements of control over your life. You were really conquered. We were really conquered. That system of indigenous governance, however it existed, was destroyed. And it has been totally obliterated. And so what we are left with is an emerging uh, tomorrow people. And that's a slightly different phenomena. A phenomena that I think has been kind of overlooked. And that is that the Chamorro people emerged as a people in much the same way that the Filipino people emerged in the 19th century. And in much the same way that the Mexican people emerged in the 19th century. And that was a mixture of original identity and a kind of a national identity. That's who the Chamorro people were. So the term Chamorro itself, even though it existed for a couple of centuries before that, really came into its own in the 19th century, in the same way that the word Mexican came to its own, Mexicano, and in the same way that the word Filipino came into its own. And interestingly, the word Filipino was originally meant to refer to Spaniards who were born in the Philippines, eventually kind of manifested, twisted and turned, and became the articulator of the Filipino national identity. So we have this. This is the desire to build a kind of a nation. This is a slightly different phenomena, and it's, it's very different than the kind of concern with indigenous issues, which came later on in the, towards the end of the 20th century. It's a very different phenomena, but very much very clear that Spanish authorities, American authorities, as they came in at the uh, beginning of the 20th century, understood that when they were talking about the political essence of Guam, they were talking about these people who called themselves Chamorros. And who were these people? These people were your grandparents. These people were your great-grandparents. These people were your great-great-grandparents. My concern is always that when I hear a lot of enthusiasm given to Tautotano, which I share, I just don't want to look past my grandparents and my great-grandparents. 
and my great-great-grandparents, because they had a design for life, too. They understood the world in a certain way, and that's the world that, you know, basically provided the basis for what most of us assume became part of our original uh, Chamorro identity. So in that, in the political processes of the 19th century, uh, such as they existed, <coughs> uh, colonialism, I use the C word freely and liberally. The good, thing, the good thing about the Spaniards and the good thing about the British is that they acknowledged they were colonial. So they had colonial offices. The unfortunate part about the U.S. is that they deny that they're a colony, so they don't have a colonial office. They call it something else, the Department of Interior. <laughs> so, the political processes of the 19th century allows uh, those, even though they, they, they saw it in a different uh, framework, they understood. And see, the one thing that a colonizer understands when they, uh, when they, when they, uh, when they understood, understand the relationship is that they are not the colonized. Yeah. They know that there's a distinction. Now, they may argue that, you know, I have to help you along because you're not ready yet. You're not just ready yet, and I'll have to help you along, but we're in this kind of relationship. But I know that you're not me, and I'm not you. And so that, that division is there. But there is in that process, in that, there is an acknowledgement. There is acknowledgement of who was, who was in control and who was being uh, controlled. And so even the Spaniards acknowledged that, and even certainly the early, in early American rule, that was acknowledged. Of course, this was interrupted by the Treaty of Paris, uh, and so now the Treaty of Paris offers a couple of very instructive lessons for us. One, it, it offers, again, within international law, as understood at that time, the transfer of the right of conquest from Spain uh, to the United States. Uh, so it's clear where the instruments of authority lie. They lied with Spain, now they've moved over to the United States. It acknowledged the native inhabitants of, and the creation, the, that the native inhabitants had civil and political rights that were not specified in the treaty, but they were to be determined at some point in time by Congress. So that acknowledgement is very uh, important because that acknowledgement is that there's a group of people, they're the native inhabitants, as we understood it in 1898, those are your grandparents and your great-grandparents, if you're tomorrow, those were the people that were being discussed in terms of political change for Guam. So that's a very important acknowledgement. Of course, it created the unincorporated territory. And so now that's, that's a different phenomena. That's an internal U.S. phenomena that a lot of us are not very fam not familiar with. But originally, the whole idea was that every territory of the United States, going back to the Northwest Ordinance, was that every territory was a state, an embryonic state, was a state in waiting. They just had enough people and they waited long enough, they'll become a state. People who moved there were citizens, statehood was the next step. Of course, they went and created this new phenomena by Supreme Court based on a customs case involving Puerto Rico that these people who are now being acquired, Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam, primarily, under the Treaty of Paris, were now unincorporated territories. They were not on a track to statehood. They were territories of the United States, but they were not part of. They were, uh, part of, uh, they were owned, but not part of the United States. So that freed the distinction. You know, this is the, uh, the, the comparable uh, court case in, uh, in American social policy at the time is Plessy versus Ferguson, which was separate but equal which was the same Supreme Court that gave us Plessy versus Ferguson is the Supreme Court that gave us unincorporated territory. See, so, for those of you um, separate but equal fans, you were Guam, you were separate but equal. Uh, 
<laughs> Equally separate. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the thinking was at the time. But, but you were not part of the United States. Now, that meant that they could deny you citizenship. You know, you're owned by the United States, you're now coming in, but they can deny you citizenship. It meant they can give you, uh, they can apply parts of the Constitution to you, but not all of it. They can decide. This is the plenary power of the uh, U.S. Congress that was decided. This is a very important point because there are people now who are arguing that we should become an incorporated territory. But I want you to really have a lot of introspection about that, you know, because, you know, uh, you have to go retro, go back to this time, kind of understand it, and then be thinking about what that really means, because it may sound a little bit better than it, it actually turns out to be. So you have the denial of uh, citizenship. Then you had the naval government. The naval government was in its form and in its function and its, in its rationale was based on the notion that the people of Guam, the Chamorro people, needed tutelage. They, they were kind of like in a, in a period of constant education and that the naval authorities were acting, and interestingly, in, again, it, within the legal framework, they were acting in, out of the executive branch of the federal government, not out of the legislature. They weren't acting out of Congress. They were acting out of executive because Congress had not made any law, which goes back to the Treaty of Paris, the Congress, they were waiting for Congress to pass a law uh, with respect to the civil and political rights of the native inhabitants. In the absence of that, what you had is naval government. Now, of course, then it was obvious that the tomorrow opposition to the worst forms of naval government was framed in terms of citizenship. If we acquired citizenship, then they wouldn't treat us this way. So the action, the initial action, by people like, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Leangro, F.B. Leangro, B.J. Bordalio, was all orchestrated around the idea that they should become uh, U.S. Um, uh, citizens and that that would cure it. The opposition to U.S. citizenship, when it almost reached that point in the Senate, came from the Secretary of the Navy. His justification was simple. The people of Guam should be happy the way they are because we're giving them everything, we're not charging them, and uh, you know, they're not ready yet to have the title U.S. citizen applied to them. Now, in that time frame, there's always one thing that's always, I always find it curious. There was a governor by the name of uh, Governor Bradley who created these general elections for uh, the Guam Congress. Everybody celebrates that as a kind of a milestone. But I use this point just to, to, to point out. When they had that first election for the Guam Congress in 1931, lots of excitement. People went out and voted, and they elected two houses to the Guam Congress. In the next election, when they realized that there was really no power to the Guam Congress, there wasn't enough people to fill the vacancies. People say, ah, what's the point in running? So if anybody thinks that these people were kind of children in need of tutelage, they weren't. What did they call that Guam Congress in those days? Congresun <laughs> Dammut. <laughs> Testicle Congress. Spent Congress. They knew it. I mean, that was the common refrain. But I said, but remember the Congress in Dammut? And that's exactly what they called the Guam Congress. So the whole idea, this notion that the people of Guam were in kind of unaware about what was going on, is simply wrong. People understood it. I was asked, uh, uh, you know, I, in, in uh, reviewing the history of Guam, I learned that the uh, the uh, valedictorian for the first graduating class of, of Seton Schroeder Junior High School was Richard Titano. So, you know, my mother's brother. So I asked him, so Uncle Richard, you know, what was your speech like? In the, he goes, oh, I don't know, they wrote it for me. <laughs> <laughs> it was something like, you know, stay on the farm, be, be happy to be a farmer, and, you know, uh, uh, always clean your latrine, or something along that line. So, you know, this, this preoccupation, it was a very guided kind of experience. But 
that didn't mean that the people didn't understand that. That's the, my point is that people understood it even in those days. And even people who submitted petitions early on, even when you go back to uh, the time period when the Spaniards left and the U.S. naval government was fully established, there was a six-month uh, period there where uh, one of the, uh, the mayor of Agana, uh, Paris, instituted a lot of changes. They understood what needed to be happened. So the people were not ignorant. People were not children. People knew that they had uh, certain rights and uh, that they wanted to exercise them. Now, World War II, again, gave us a different uh, uh, time frame. So now we go into the Japanese occupation and there's a new kind of political rhetoric that adds to the fervent voice of the quest for US citizenship, and that is loyalty. You know, so it's not just that, that, that we should be given U.S. citizenship just because, you know, nobody else had to work hard for it. <laughs> People in the Virgin Islands didn't have to work hard for U.S. citizenship. The U.S. bought it from the Danes and 12 years later they just passed the law and said, okay, you guys are U.S. citizens. But the people of Guam had been waiting all this time, so they had to give it kind of a new argument. So that new argument that was given was uh, uh, loyalty. Now that political argument continues to this day. Every kind of argument that we give always uh, focuses around loyalty. Not around your rights, not around your human rights, but as a kind of a reward for loyalty. It's a very strong part of the uh, uh, Chamorro cultural worldview. I think that comes from the whole idea of you know, reciprocity. I did this for you, I suffered for you, <laughs> you know, this kind of, uh, kind of world view, you know, this is, uh, this, is how, this is how we're supposed to get along. Not give me this right, why? Because I'm human. I don't have to prove my loyalty. I don't have to prove anything. What it, the notion of human rights doesn't proceed from loyalty. The notion of human rights proceeds from being human. And last time I checked, <laughs> last time I checked, Chamorros were human. <laughs> now, the quest for U.S. citizenship uh, then had that, uh, that, 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 uh, that tone to it. And the predictable opposition originally, of course, came from the Navy in a certain uh, light, you know. There's uh, one quote that's always used, it's been used a lot, and that is by F.B. Leonguerro. By this time, the, the, the struggle was led by uh, Mr. Leonguerro and the speaker's father, Mr. Wampat. And uh, one uh, quote that's often used about uh, F.B. Leonguerro is that uh, he went to Congress and he said, there's always only going to be one ism in Guam, and that's Americanism. And that, that quote has been used a lot. Now, I thought about that for years, and I kept wondering, why, why would he, this was, this was the man, F.B. Leonguerro was a little bit different than all the other political leaders on Guam. He was the most confrontational. He was clearly the most confrontational. You know, there's the story of the governor getting off his horse and giving him the reins and saying, no, I don't, I'm not, I'm not your stable boy. There's all these things, you know, he refused to stand up whenever the governor walked in. There were all these kinds of stories about Mr. Leon Guerrero. And so why would he say this? There's only one, uh, uh, Amer there's only one ism in Guam, and that's Americanism. So, you know, there's, uh, some of it might be related to the fact that the way Mr. F.B. Leon Guerrero was dealt with by some of the naval authorities was they characterized him as being uh, pro-communist, which was a favorite canard in the 40s and the 50s. And the only way that Mr. Leon Guerrero could defend himself was to say that he was for only one ism. But we also had in there uh, new friends and a new international climate. There was a very vibrant uh, liberal movement inside the U.S. Uh, society. Uh, there was a different international climate, the creation of the United Nations, uh, the UN Charter, the recognition of non-self-governing territories. All of these things came at the same time that there was this political foment, uh, uh, fomenting that was going on in Guam, the congressional walkout, 
uh, all of this attention. And so this resulted uh, in the Organic Act. Okay, the full story of this, how much was, uh, was done in relationship to uh, new friendships in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., we'll never know. There was one uh, well-known attorney by the name of Richard Wells who was actually out here uh, as, a, as a naval attorney uh, in 1945 and 1946, very upset by what he saw. He went back, went back to practicing law in New York, had a good friend who was editor of the New York Times, and almost on a regular basis thereafter, there was a letter to the editor that was published in the New York Times almost every month about Guam. So, you know, there's all these things that are going on at the same time, that uh, there's all this political foment. So it resulted in the Organic Act. Now, by that time, of course, uh, the, the word Chamorro had shifted, and people no longer used the term Chamorro. Uh, they now use the term Guamanian. Now we're redefining Guamanian today. I don't want to get involved in that, but, you know, that we, you know. Anyways, back in 1950, <laughs> When the Organic Act was passed, it was clear what was meant uh, by uh, uh, Guamanian. So that term, uh, so the only people who were declared citizens in mass were people born on Guam who had ancestry going back to before 1898, which meant that it could only be the Chamorro people. It also recognized that they had um, uh, gave preference to, uh, in government of Guam employment, uh, preference was given to persons of Guamanian ancestry, and that continued all the way until 1970, and many people don't know, as a trade-off for elective governorship. When elected governorship was passed, they took out the preference for people of Guamanian ancestry from the Organic Act, and that was uh, orchestrated by uh, then Congresswoman Mink from Hawaii. So uh, the Organic Act became the place which recognized Guamanians uh, as, a, as, a, as a political category. So this still has political life that's very different than just saying Chamorro people are an indigenous group. People, Chamorros being an indigenous group adds to that, but there's also a clear legal line in how we define uh, Guamanians as passed in federal legislation and in, uh, in things going back to the Treaty of Paris which does not exist in other territories. So, you know, it's a little bit stronger line for us. Now, there are some people who argue that we should just be content with incremental progress. And there's been a lot of incremental progress. I would venture to say that outside this room, 80% of the people are more concerned with incremental progress than the exercise of tomorrow self-determination. I mean, that's the reality of it. So how do we measure this incremental progress? Participation in the Great Society program of the 1960s. You know, up until the time of uh, the, the, the presidency of LBJ, the government of Guam almost participated in no federal programs. After that, Title I, Title II, Title III, you name every title you want, there was enough federal money to employ everybody on the island. <laughs> so the, the whole notion that this was being made possible. And how was this being made possible? Well, one of the things that is going on, of course, is that we elected, at that time, we elected Mr. Wampat to go to Washington, D.C., and that was part of his task. Even though he wasn't an elected member of the U.S. House, it was part of his task to continue to seek this federal funding. So you had the federal funding, the urban renewal, all of this money that started to pump into Guam. The budget of the government of Guam in the 1960s grew by about 500%. So, you know, for people looking at that saying, well, what's there to argue with? You know, this is good progress. This is something that we ought to take a look at. Same thing, elective governorship passed in 19, uh, actually a little bit earlier than that, but we had our first elected governor in 1970, elected uh, delegate in 1972 increased uh, reliance on federal funding and participation as determination of progress, political progress, social progress, and all of this money, if people were asked, did you deserve this money? Did you deserve to get urban renewal? 
Did you deserve to participate in this federal program? You don't pay taxes. You're not putting one nickel into that federal kitty, but you're drawing from it. People say, yes, we deserve it, because why? Because we were loyal in World War II. That was, that's the drum beat. we're loyal. We were loyal in World War II, and then added to that, the, the notion of Guam's uh, emerging role in military uh, strategy, and also the fact of the high rates of participation uh, by young men of Guam in the Korean War, Vietnam War, and men and women in subsequent wars. This is a very important part of our political thinking. So, you know, it's almost like we live in this bifurcated world. On one day, we're angry about the lack of tomorrow self-determination. And the other day, we're angry about not being rewarded for our loyalty. Well, we want to be loyal, we want to be disloyal, we want to be part of, we don't want to be part of. What's going on? People, because of this kind of constant churning and mixture, I think, of historical metaphors. That's why I'm not here to clarify which metaphor you should go for, but I am here to point out that there are mixed historical metaphors out there that are constantly uh, part of the political dialogue. And when you're out there conversing with people, not everyone shares the same metaphor. Not everyone uh, invests the same meaning into each and every historical circumstance. And because they don't do that, you just think they are. Well, they must understand it the way I do. But maybe it's not all that clear. So, now then the counter distinction is well, it's not incremental progress, it's fundamental political status change. Now, up until the 70s, the people of Guam were content with the, the incremental change and the fact that they were getting larger and larger amounts of federal assistance as a reward for their um, uh, loyalty. So they kind of led themselves to believe this. You know. So, as a reward for loyalty. So now they started talking about political status change. Well, what started that? Well, I think what started it is the conversations that started to occur in Saipan but under the leadership of the, the Congress of Micronesia, when they started talking about political status change. So now what you had in the political leadership of Guam is people would They've been trying to talk to federal leaders for a long time about, you know, can we talk about our political future? People would say, well, what, are you unhappy? You need more money? What is it that you want, really? And they'd say, no, no, you know, there's no need to have these conversations. And these were to people who were loyal. Well, now, all of a sudden, 1970, 71 comes around, there's federal official after federal official flying right into Guam and then flying right out to go to Saipan to have these conversations, high-level conversations with Micronesian leaders about a political future. And the people of Guam, at least the political leadership, felt like, well, you know, what happened to the reward for loyalty? I thought we were going to get acknowledged for this loyalty. It didn't, didn't, didn't work out that way. Instead, what you had happen was that the the, the international climate, the concern about the, the UN putting pressure on the US and what was going on in Micronesia, all of these things were churning at the same time and it was obvious that the US government had to pay attention to that and so they did. And so what was happening to the people of Guam? Nothing. So the Guam legislature, as they have done, I think, in for the past few years, you know, there's, uh, there's another dynamic at work. Who's in charge of self-determination for Guam? Is it the Guam legislature or is it the governor? Well, we want to say outwardly that we're all in charge and we're all getting along and we're all happy to work it all out. But in reality, usually it's one, it's either the legislature is driving the show or the governor is driving the show. 
Well, originally it was the Guam legislature. That goes back to the 12th and the 13th and the 14th Guam legislatures. It was the legislature that was driving the show. And so they were the ones who were writing the articles in the newspaper and kind of pushing the envelope, causing a political status referendum to occur. You remember that political status referendum in 1976? You could go there and I think they had like 15 options. No, they didn't have <laughs> and they had six or seven options. And uh, the, uh, the option that won, 51%, was status quo with improvements. Now, who wouldn't like that? <laughs> I want things to stay the same, only better. <laughs> so that was the option that won. <laughs> I think they put that option in just so that people would say, yeah, that, that status quo with improvements, not just status quo, period. Not the kind of uh, uh, scenario that uh, Carla has outlined is going on with Puerto Rico, where it just says status quo, period. <laughs> this one is status quo with improvements. Well, that's what won. Well, in the meantime, of course, this is the so-called uh, secret offer, which it's called secret because we never heard of it. <laughs> That was a good secret. When you don't hear about it, it was a secret well kept. So in that conversation, in that what is going on in Micronesia, in that conversation is that the U.S. has to kind of reinforce its, its um, flexibility, its military flexibility. So they're negotiating a separate arrangement with the, what emerges to be the CNMI. So in that process, they're negotiating a separate arrangement. Now, the, you know, if you were like a long-time political observer in Guam in 1975, and you're watching this, you're thinking, these people in the CNMI, well, you know, we just had a referendum in 1968, and they asked the people of Guam, do you want to reunite with the CNMI? And we said, no. Then they asked the people in the northern, do you want to reunite with Guam? And they said, yes. Now, you fast forward that seven years later, and every federal official in the world is talking to these people, but they're not talking to anybody from Guam. So it was a very dispiriting time to be in political leadership in that context in Guam. So the CNMI uh, has this, so, you know, a little bit of pressure. So obviously there was a memo put out that if Guam starts to agitate for anything, we would give them the same thing that we're giving those, uh, we'll give Guam the same thing that we're giving to the CNMI. Yeah, so yeah, we'll give the loyal people the same thing. I heard this from Ben. Ben shouted it out, but I didn't. <laughs> Senator Pangolina. But that's the mindset, and it's true. It's true, Senator Pangolina. The mindset at the, in the 70s was that they're gonna give to the loyal people of Guam the same thing that they gave to this, those disloyal people in Saipan. You know, this was the, kind of the popular mindset. But in actuality, what was happening was that international events were kind of uh, driving the show. So the Northern Marianas got this Commonwealth deal, which apparently they're now rethinking. <laughs> but at, at the time, uh, it seemed like a very progressive deal, a lot of internal control, uh, that was really absent in the case of Guam. So what happens is that in response to this secret offer, Congress decides that they're going to assert their control over the political status process. So what they did is, all right, since the president should not be, the executive should not be talking to these uh, individual territories, we have to give the territories something. So they gave the territories the right to create a constitution, a local uh, man. Uh, con so, so congressional a action, uh, assertion of authority, is to then offer the constitution. So they offered Guam the right to form a constitution. They offered the USVI uh, the right to form a constitution. Guam tried it once. The VI, I think, is on their fifth attempt. <laughs> What, is it the fifth attempt? Fifth, yeah. Five constitutions later, they still haven't ratified it, but they've done it five times. But Guam only tried it once. But basically, uh, the, the, the role of the executive branch has receded 
in this process and has deferred it to uh, Congress, and that's uh, where we stand. All right. So now you had the Constitution, the, the ratification process, in which Marilyn and I had a very important role. <laughs> so, Senator Manabusan, excuse me. Uh, the, the, the Guam Constitution campaign reveals that there were kind of like these two fundamental different views about political process. One said, yeah, we should go with the incremental changes, and the other said, no, we should just, you know, go for the whole political status thing first, and then you build a constitution around it. So that was the fundamental issue at stake. Of course, then the, uh, the constitution failed, and so then the people of Guam were kind of left like, well, what are we going to do next? In the meantime, a few people had discovered the UN process. <laughs> so the first people to go to the United Nations were me, Ron Tehan, who's in the audience, and uh, Chris Paris Howard. So we bought ourselves a suit and went to New York. <laughs> <laughs> I only had one suit in those days, no longer fit. <laughs> so anyway, so we went to New York and we testified. You know, I prepared the testimony and I testified in front of the UN. So that was, uh, you know, a, kind of a highly charged moment for us because A, we didn't know, you know, obviously nobody in government of Guam supported us. No, no self-respecting legislature at the time even wanted to talk to us about it. What? You're going to the UN? What's wrong with you? <laughs> so anyways, we just uh, bit the bullet and went ahead. And I have to say that as I was talking, the biggest fans I had were the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the representatives from Iraq and Cuba. They were my <laughs> biggest fans. <laughs> Ron kept saying, Let's go talk to them. And I kept saying, no. Nah. <laughs> Ron was all about, yeah, let's go talk to them. I said, no, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know who these guys are. We already did what we did. You know, let's get a couple of tickets to some Broadway show while we're here. <laughs> okay. So then, of course, the, the government of Guam, the... the, 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 the political powers decided that this was a time to create a commission on self-determination. So it's no longer the commission on political status. So the term commission on self-determination, you know, was instructive. It created a different sense to it. And of course, at the very, uh, uh, the governor is the one who takes charge of this. So it's the governor is the one that's going to take charge of this process. And of course, uh, you know, some governors paid a lot of attention to it. <laughs> Some governors paid no attention to it. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you which governors. <laughs> you can draw that for yourself. <laughs> Some governors paid a lot of attention to this responsibility. Some governors, you know, don't even know what these words mean. So anyways. So the, the, the first question that is raised in the whole notion of the Commission on Self-Determination is, who is this? Who's the self? You know, obviously that's the next question. If we're going to be determining, well, who's, who's self? Who is the self-determination? Uh, that was the original question when uh, Governor Calvo convened it. And it was the original question by uh, Richard Titano. And he was a member. And he says, until you answer this, I'm not coming back. And he, ne he never came back. Because no one wanted to answer it. But, oh, no, 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 you know. <laughs> We don't know what we really mean by the self. I don't know who I am. <laughs> now I'm out of gas. All right, there we go. So then out of this Commission on Self-Determination came the Commonwealth Draft Act. So then you had the Commonwealth Draft Act. They said, put in the kitchen sink, so they did. <laughs> They put everything in that Commonwealth Draft Act. You name it, it was like that Commonwealth Draft Act was like a combination of the incremental progress and the fundamental political status change. It was like, 
we're not letting anything get by us. We're going to put everything that we ever wanted in this draft act. And so that's what happened. And so there were 12 different articles, some on transportation, some on immigration, some on Chamorro self-determination, kind of hinted at Chamorro self. was very cleverly worded. Didn't say it directly, but kind of worded that around Chamorro self-determination. And so those were articles one and seven. Seven was immigration, and article one referred to uh, Chamorro self-determination. So under, under GovGuam law, if these uh, articles, they sent out the 12 articles, and if the articles did not pass, then the, the commission was going to rewrite the articles and then put them out again. So the articles didn't pass, but the commission said, no, we're not going to rewrite the articles. We'll just have another election and hope more people show up. So then you had the Friends of Article 1 and 7 <laughs> movement, and they eventually got it passed. So that was uh, the approach. Now, of course, uh, that was done, uh, you know, uh, the decision at the time was they were going to go all or nothing. And so, you know, when you go all or nothing, sometimes you end up with nothing. All right. So that's what we ended up with, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so and then uh, the reintroduction of the act, that was, uh, this was uh, the only, you know, we had a congressional hearing on the first draft act in Hawaii I think in 1989, I'm not sure, 1989, it was, uh, you know, it was called a congressional field hearing. When you see the word congressional field hearing, it means nobody's there except maybe one or two members of Congress, you know. But if you, so that field hearing actually had only a, a delegate de Lugo there in, in Honolulu. Then in 1997, we had the congressional hearing and now that hearing, I think we had like about over 25 members of the resources committee at that hearing. Now that took a lot of work on my part. I had to go around and talk to a lot of members. And so they all said, oh yeah, right, okay, I'll sit there. How long am I supposed to sit there? I said, can you sit there for at least 15 minutes? Okay, 15 minutes. They're all looking at their watch. <laughs> so at least there was a, a bigger turnout. But of course the results uh, were the same. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Uh, there was uh, the mood in Congress was affected by a lot of different things. There was the fight between the Republican-controlled Congress and, and uh, President Clinton. Uh, there was a fight over uh, political donations. All kinds of things were going on, which kind of uh, soured the process. So it kind of came back, and now the Guam legislature has kind of again reasserted its authority, and this time it has introduced legislation which kind of parallels the process that uh, Carlisle has outlined here, which is to, to call it now, we're no longer calling it the uh, Commission on Self-Determination, we're now calling it the Commission on Decolonization, and we now have a process, a uh, tomorrow registry, in order to make this happen. So the question at the end of the day is for people that are sitting out there at home who may be wondering, what, what isn't for me? Am, am I agitated by this whole process because I'm being denied my right as an American? Or am I being denied my inalienable right to self-determination, which goes back hundreds of years? That's really the context for a lot of the thinking that is going on out there. Now, the denial of consent of the governed, the current system is colonial be not because the U.S. government is composed of people who are mean and evil, it's because it is a denial of a basic tenet of American democracy. It is an un-American government. And that is that government proceeds from consent of the governed. It does not. The government of Guam exists as a result of an act of Congress. A Congress in which there is no voting member from uh, Guam. So there is no consent of the governor. I, when I was in Congress, I, when I, there's a, in the Capitol building, they have a credit union office. I love to go to that credit union office, check how much money I have. <laughs> go to the credit union and, you know, as in Congress everywhere, you know, in the Capitol building, they have uh, little uh, sayings all over the place. And there's a saying right above that credit union office that says, 
the only legitimate uh, right to govern is consent of the governed. And that was uh, William Henry Harrison. And uh, I, 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 I always like to point that out because William Henry Harrison was not only president of uh, the United States, he was also a territorial delegate. His first elected office was to be a delegate, not a, not a, con not a representative. But his first uh, was to be a delegate to the uh, U.S. House. He also was the only uh, president. I think he died 30 days in office, something like that. So, but, so some people say, is this the perfection of American citizenship? Or is this the completion of Chamorro self-determination? That's a very live conversation out there. It's a very live issue in much the same way that originally in the uh, American Revolution and all the way through it, there were some people who were agitated because they were being their, denied their rights as Englishmen. The English government was being denying us Englishmen who lived in the colonies, so the story went, our rights as Englishmen. And then there were some who said, no, we're forming a new nation. We're forming a different reality. We're talking about whereas in the course of human events, and they had a different sense of it. So these are the, com th these are the competing views of history and I think strategies for uh, ultimate resolution. And out of regard and respect for those, there are people who, who, who see this as the effort to perfect uh, our uh, relationship with the U.S., to perfect our status as Americans, are more likely to fall along the idea that we should uh, try to exhaust all efforts to make us an incorporated territory. We should move in that direction. We should acquire more federal funding. We should get more benefits from this relationship. Whereas others will say, no, we have to uh, stop, take a deep breath, and try to get this uh, process of uh, Chamorro self-determination once and for all. But even in that process of Chamorro self-determination, it's unclear where the Chamorros will vote if they actually came uh, to this issue. So in disentangling the history of Guam and the Chamorro people, I think, I still believe we need to go retro, we need to go back and think about this past. We need to understand it uh, before we can go become introspective. I believe, I firmly believe that the Chamorro people have been denied their right to self-determination and that unless this is first addressed in Hagatnya, there will never be a permanent solution to Guam's political status. The Chamorro people have that right. I also recognize that legal authority over Guam exists in Washington, D.C., and not at the United Nations in New York. The federal government holds the instruments of government in all its forms that exist in Guam. The federal government holds the power and the authority. In the struggle between right and power, right and might, if you will, we can all come to different conclusions about which will prevail. We can be realists and give in to those who argue that whatever is decided in Washington, D.C. must serve as our guide. We can be dreamers and argue that tomorrow self-determination is the cause of our generation, the cause of our time, the cause of our existence. History is a tough teacher, and there's room for realist lessons and dreamer lessons. The inspiration of our experiences will always fuel our aspirations. But idle dreaming and visionary thinking will never be sufficient. Whomever is willing to work the hardest, whomever is willing to perspire the most, it is their aspiration which will take hold. And it is them that will build a future for our island, for Guaha. Thank you very much. Okay, at this point, wow, what a wonderful uh, presentation, um, Congressman Underwood. Marilyn. 
Yes, I believe that we are going to fuel our minds with uh, lunch from the Bank of Guam. And then, um, please don't go. The legislature has provided lunch for all our guests and our, uh, and our panel guests also. Uh, this afternoon, you're going to see um, a vibrant discussion among the brilliant minds of um, our lawyers. And um, we will talk about just the processes and the legal framework. But again, please don't leave. We will have questions and answers when we resume after lunch. Uh, speaker, you want to make the formal invitation? OK. So thank you all. We're going to take our lunch break now. And then we'll entertain questions and answers. Uh, 1 o'clock, we'll resume right back in here in the legislative hall. Thank you so much. <laughs>